Hello, 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 hello. Welcome back. Welcome back again. And uh, this time, uh, we're going to change things up a bit. I'm going to be making a four part mini series, you could say, um, of four different movies. And the main theme is going to be the sequels, part two. Um, is Are the sequels necessarily worse than the prequels, than the part one movies? Or can they also be good or even better? Well, we're going we're gonna to be talking about that. And I do have a couple of thoughts as to what could affect it. What, whether a part two movie is actually good or not. But I'll get to that when I get to that. But for now, we're going to be talking about Rebel Moon Part 2, The Scar Giver. Now, this movie was released by Netflix uh, this this month, April of 2024. Um, a few months after the release of the Part 1 of Rebel Moon, which I can't remember what was like the second name it had, like Rebel Moon something. At any rate, let's get into the movie. So... Again, this is not going to be like a play-by-play -play of the entire film because the movie is quite long. But in case you don't remember, from part one, we have our main character, Korra, who she, well, she has a past history with this empire, galactic empire that's trying to uh, dominate all the other planets and all the other uh, you know, life forms of the whole universe. And that, and that sounds like familiar to like Star Wars or to Dune. Well, you wouldn't be wrong. It does take a lot of influence from those type of films. Now, Korra, when she decides to leave the army, she goes to this planet where she stays there for two seasons, which you can imagine might mean two years, two planetary years, or yeah whatever that may be because not all planets orbit 365 days around their sun but she's there for two seasons and when the army that she used to belong to comes over and now they're demanding payments like you have to give us grains if not we are going to destroy everything you know and they do kill like the village elder and they do like their own thing to intimidate them and that's when Korra kind of like uh, she wants to flee, she wants to stay, and to make a long story short, I mean, she does deal with the few soldiers that stay, but then she knows that they're going to come back, so she goes into this intergalactic um, journey into, you know, basically recruiting the the suicide squad, and they do, they do arrive, they do kind of like save the day for a bit, before they return back to the planet and now they have to, you know, wait for that incoming invasion from the Empire. Now, having said that, part two, we are kind of continuing on from that point. Now, even though they did defeat the Admiral in the first part, they still are contending with the Empire coming back and, you know, reclaiming those grains that they that they demanded so passionately. So what happens is, well, Korra and her, I guess you could say friends, they go and they do their thing. I mean, immediately they start preparing, preparing for battle. And, you know, there is this discussion about, okay, so we'll use the grains as kind of like, uh, like a shield because if they, shoot at the village they're going to destroy the grains and that's kind of counterproductive to what they want so in a way that's how they are going to sort of defend themselves but they do leave traps and they do everything they can so that they're prepared and if well i don't know how much you remember like the names but you know you have uh, the mighty titus or general titus who he's Teaching the people how to fight, you know, how to use a weapon, how to shoot, all those different things. And the rest are also helping out, you know, preparing for the incoming attack. Well, they come over and turns out that the Admiral they thought they defeated, yeah, he was, isn't 
quite dead. And so now they're desperately trying to defend themselves. Korra does eventually go back up to the mothership, we could say. And over there, she does destroy the entire ship. It goes down. She defeats the Admiral at last. Apparently, because we don't actually see the body. And in movies, basically, if you don't see the dead body, they're not really dead. But I digress. After the ship goes down, uh, because the other soldiers were able to get out of the ship, they start attacking. But before they can actually attack, uh, there there's like a Deus Ex Machina type of thing where you know, the unexpected arrival of allies saves the day and now they're all great and good, right? And eh, not quite. I mean, we don't know that for sure because, again, it is a part two and we don't know if there's going to be any future parts. But having said that, it might sound like it's a quite negative review, but it's not. I mean, in all honesty, I did enjoy the film for what it was. One thing to note is there are a lot of criticisms in terms of the use of slow motion. So I already finished talking about the main part of the film, what's mainly about. If there's like a few criticisms that there are, uh, a lot of people say that, oh, there's a lot of slow motion. There's too much. I didn't think it was that much. I did think there was some slow motion parts in unnecessary places. And it kind of goes back to the first film, um, issues that the first film also had, which was with pacing. And so in the film, when they're preparing for the upcoming war, part of that, pre that preparation is uh, collecting the, the grains, you know, putting the wheat and, and you know, getting the seeds out and, and all of that. But then they do the slow motion of them cutting the wheat and of them kind of like hitting the wheat so that they can take the grains out of it. It feels unnecessary and it just makes the movie longer in places where it doesn't need to be that long. And it does affect overall like where they should have focused that time more in the film. So uh, another example would be kind of like in the first film they one of my own criticisms was that they didn't spend enough time with the characters i mean you spend a lot of time with Korra, but you don't spend enough time with the all the other characters because it's they go to one planet they go to another they go to another they go to another they recruit one person they go to the next planet recruit the other so basically it's just like Imagine it if it's like a video game. It's just like one mission after another. Like, okay, go for this, 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 and that's it. And now you have your team. And it doesn't really give you enough time to actually enjoy and relate to the characters. Kind of like my case in point. In this film, um, they have a scene where all the characters are together. And it's the night before the attack. And the team basically has this. I don't want to say it's forced, but they have this moment where they say, okay. Titus says, well, now is the time to confess, which is just like their way of saying, okay, now we're going to give more background to the other characters. Right. And so one character um, who is kind of like this I want to say kind of like a Jedi you could say because she does wield these swords that heat up and she's not the only one by any chance because the Empire that also has soldiers that do that but in the way they fight it feels very much like they're lightsabers from Star Wars and her background story is that in her home planet, the Empire arrives. They basically kill her entire people. And not only that, but she also, uh, well, she loses her family. 
her family, her husband, her children. And this leaves her for a thirst for revenge. And the way she does that is that she gets to these gauntlets that her family has. They're like heirlooms. She cuts her arms and uses the gauntlets as her arms. And the arms are, and the gauntlets are kind of like very robotic. So they do attach themselves to her body and they actually can be used as arms and fingers and hands. I mean, they are functional, but they also allow her to, you know, wield the swords with a lot of strength and not get burned and all these other things. So it, it is like a very, very fat, sad story because she loses her family, she loses her children. And when you see her in the village interacting with the children, it's kind of like she and that's her like moment of peace. And that's her reason why she wants to protect the village to protect the children that she couldn't protect. And with this child in particular, she makes this bond where, you know, he kind of messes around with her and she also kind of like messes around with him. But it's that kind of connection that it's significant. But again, we didn't see that in the first film. And in the second one, it's kind of happens very fast. And she is a very likable character, but again, when you have a film like this where it feels rushed, that you have to feel a connection with not only her, but now you have to also make a connection with, well, the other team members. So Cora, you already know her, but you also have Atticus, and then you have, uh, well, not Gunner, but you have uh, uh, Darian, who, uh, well, I don't know, there's a lot of people, so I can't, there's a lot of characters, so I don't really remember their names, but it all comes back to the same thing. I mean, you have to make a connection with everyone, and you can't because it's too short of a time. It's still short of a time. Um, Jimmy is back. Jimmy is, from the first film, he's kind of like the robot that the Empire brings over. A robot who was meant to protect the royal family but since the royal family was assassinated now they no longer have a purpose and so these robots kind of no longer are are functional they no longer fight i mean they can use them as labor but that's about it and so they bring one and because that robot somehow kind of overrides its own system uh when one of the soldiers was attacking a woman from the village a young lady uh you know he does save her and runs away but he's back in the second film and that's another kind of mystery that hasn't been solved there's kind of like a few things that are not answered in this movie that should have been answered um but as a character himself i did like jimmy a lot i mean jimmy has Despite being a robot, he has a lot of personality. A lot of personality. So I do hope that he, if they make a part three, that he comes back and they do explain his backstory of, you know, who is Jimmy? And it may be, um, well, kind of like a spoiler alert for Dune, but uh, if he is sort of kind of like, um, like a Paul's friend, like who was a general in the army he's dead but then they kind of use his mind to program all the other robots so those so now there's more of him but they're in a robot form to and they can they still have like the consciousness and thoughts but it's no longer that same person it's kind of like they copy and pasted their brain into robots, if that makes sense. So I'm wondering that's the same case with Jimmy. All right. Um, you know what? Let's stop complaining a bit because I did really enjoy the film. I mean, for what it was, again, it does follow through with what they meant to in the part one. You know, you go into the battle, you save the village, all of this. 
the action sequences were actually pretty amazing. I mean, especially when they are uh, shooting at like the the machines that are coming over to the town, and they're exp you know they're blowing them up with these uh, you know these missiles, these projectiles. I mean, those are amazing. Like the soundtrack is also amazing. It really, really feels a thump, and you really feel like that beats like there's a stake and you know all these actions action sequences were very good i mean even in the ship when it was just cora you know, the way that she you know jumps on 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 the walls and then the way that she shoots at everybody and the way that she you can tell that she is an experienced fighter and that there is a reason why the admiral and why other soldiers are afraid of her Although that doesn't explain why necessarily she's called a scar, scar giver. And I think if they would have focused on who she gave the scar to, not that they focused, but if they could have just focused on in the confession part, you know, on that night before the attack, if they would have focused on, okay, who did she give that scar to that that's why she's called the scar giver? Maybe she gave a scar to. And and that actually would have been a good one. Maybe she gave us a scar to Belisarius. Belisarius is kind of like the the main villain who we don't see. Like we see him in flashbacks. We don't actually see him in the films as like a part of it. We only see like the like the mini bosses, and you know if he had a scar, and that was because maybe when you know she was trying to escape and Belisarius was in the way, and she. Gave, gave him the scar and you know that's it that would have been something however uh the thing with the admiral so kind of to like wrap this up with the admiral when they pick him up you know he, he they thought he was dead in part one but they picked him up and then they put him in this solution and they do all these medical things to keep him alive he is left with a scar, but that's for his choice. He says, leave the scar. That's kind of like what she gave me. And so when I bring her over to the Empire and I show her that body, then I will show my chest and say, hey, this is like my. This is a kind of like my proof or this is like my Medal of Honor for having killed the scar giver. For this like big accomplishment. So it's not really like a reason why she would be called a scar giver, especially when nobody knows that he has a scar to begin with, except for the medics in the ship. So it's not really enough to explain that name, scar giver. But yeah, that's kind of like besides the point. A lot of action sequences. The characters are fun. I mean, the characters you do enjoy them. They do have their personalities and the actors do a very good job. Where I think it all falls down or falls, falls short is when you come to pacing. The pacing is what kills it. If they could have given, taken their time. Because they present Belisarius from the part one as like the main villain. Like he's the one that we have to go after. But the problem is we have to save the village. Well, if they could have focused on the first film as okay instead of rushing everything because i do think they spend too much time in the beginning of part one they spend too much time uh, with cora being in the village and her being traumatized if they would have spent less time with that and more time with okay one planet you meet this one okay background we knew we know them oh they do their antics blah 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 you know they make their bond Next planet, meet the another person, background, another bonding moment, etc. I mean, if we would have had that and made, like, for example, the best, the best way I could describe it is imagine the Lord of the Rings, right? In the Lord of the Rings, we did have, in part one, we had in the Fellowship, we had the battle on, uh, you know, with the ring raves where Rodo is, is stabbed. Then we have when they, you know, chase chase him over to Rivendell, and even 
after Rivendell, they do have a fight with this monster before they arrive to Minas Tirith, or not Minas Tirith, I mean, um, well, to the, to, the, to the mountains, right? Where Gimli's Rotas are. There isn't like a main battle, but there is a sequence of mini battles. And the village feels like it should have been a mini battle and not so much as a main battle for it to be. And so that in part two, you could finish like bonding the team together because now that they've saved the village and have them kind of give them that respite that, okay, now they're having a little bit of peace and all that and not have the whole, oh, that Admiral is not, is dead, but he's not really dead. And then he comes back. Like if you would have erased that and just have like, okay, they fought the Admiral, but at the village, when he comes back, they saved the village on time. They stay there for a bit. They're peaceful, but they realize they have to go get Belisarius. Okay, now part two is now what do they do next? You know, and then you can make a part three as like, all right, the main battle, kind of like, um, kind of like the battle that is in Minas Tirith in part three, where they have to defend the last kingdom of men that can stand up against uh, Sauron and his army. Well, that could have been that battle, but in part three. And that is when they're going to meet Tabari Sarus. And that would have made more sense, and that would have stretched out and made the pacing much easier. I think they were trying to do too much in two parts. One, there isn't enough background in background story for, so that people can look over in the internet and find out more if they want to. But they also don't explain enough for people to get, and that's kind of like a valid criticism that I did here, that it's not enough background or it's not enough of the universe for people to care about. Personally, I did like it and I do see potential, but the writers do have to do a better job when writing the story and figuring out a pace to make the story more compelling. If they are trying to, and it's okay if they want to, you know, take inspiration from Dune, from Star Wars, it, they wouldn't be the first. But they should really, you know, look what they did right, what Star Wars did right, for example, and not just go off in their own and say, oh, okay, we're just going to take these elements and then we're going to do our own thing. Like, mm, there's things that work for a reason. But at any rate, I think I rumble on too much. I did like the movie. Like I said, there is potential. The action sequences were phenomenal. The story was good. I mean, it, it is a good story. The characters could have been fleshed out a little bit more. The bonding between the characters could be fleshed out a little bit more because it felt, again, a little bit rushed. Uh, there are moments in the film that should not have taken a, as much time as they did. Like the sequence with um, collecting the grains and, and all that. And focus more in other areas. But again, that's more on the writers. And probably the producers as well. Because they should have said something as well. But, you know, the, the actors, the musical score, visual effects, everything was done right. Like, they did their jobs. The fault is not with them. The fault is with the people, the people behind the scenes that should have done better with the story, given that the story doesn't exist anywhere else. I mean, I, I even have the idea of, well, why not? If you have this type of movies that are going to be like this, why not in between movies kind of, or even like before the first movie have like shorts or mini like mini trailers that are like mini shorts of the of the universe it doesn't have to be of the characters themselves but you know so just something so that if people want to look back and go oh okay that's how the universe works or oh that's 
kind of like what's going on to kind of like give a deeper, deeper understanding. But that's just my thoughts. And as far as this being a part two, it did what it needed to do. It did continue the story from where it left off. And I do feel that it has the potential. It's better than what most people are saying it is. I think people are just being too critical of it. But I also might be just being too soft on it. At any rate, take care. Leave a comment if you think differently. Uh, you know, hopefully there will be a good discussion in the comments. And just remember something. Just remember. Be kind to everyone. And be kind to everybody around you. You never know what they're going through. See you later on part two of part two. Bye-bye.